Right, I don't know if you can hear me. I hope you can. I want to tell you a story. And I hope that I frightened you a little bit by putting mathematics in the title. That should prepare you, because there will be a little bit of maths, and I don't apologize for it. Um, and also, you may have noticed, and that can be some relief, that I put complex stream data 1, and there is a complex stream data 2, and I plan to be a little bit of time in the middle where you can run away, get your breath, or whatever. Okay? So that's the time, I hope, for some questions. And finally, I should mention I'm deaf, pretty much. So when it comes to questions, you're going to have to shout. And maybe we have to negotiate several times to figure out what you're trying to say. OK, thank you very much. Well, that's good. It was working fine earlier. Ah. OK. So I want to tackle a question that I think is surprisingly common. And I'm going to try and explain it to you. And that is how we handle stream data. I would like to argue that, and this bit's not science, this is just my own observation, human beings actually really understand a concept of stream data, just as we understand number. And at the same time, it's remarkably varied, the way that streams of data turn up in our lives, and in our processes, in our systems, and in our physics, is remarkably varied. So on the left, is some Chinese handwriting being drawn with your finger on the screen um, in an app put together by my colleagues at the South China, uh, South China University of Technology. And um, that's one example of a stream of data, the movement of the finger on the screen. But there are so many others that I'm not going to go through them like a catalog. But I want to capture some of them are human. Most of them are complicated. They vary enormously in terms of the dimensionality. A video is a good example of something of very high dimension, but still it has a crucial evolving aspect. It can be quite simple in dimension, like astronomical data, but massive in frequency. Or just plain complicated, like the electronic health record of a patient in hospital. Why is that complicated? Well, actually, there's so many things that you might do and probably don't do for a given person. And this spreadsheet way of thinking of time series, where you think of all the things at once, is clearly not appropriate there. OK, so there are an enormous number of different examples of evolving multimodal data where the order of things matters. It's clearly different if you take paracetamol and then your temperature goes up, then if you go take para your temperature goes up and then you take paracetamol. Order in channels matters. And that's an indication of why we need something to do. Because many techniques for looking at stream data think like time series, but they think like one-dimensional time series. And their basic idea is we understand each series separately and then we superimpose them. That's a very linear model, which does not really apply. And if you have a linear model, you, you took um, paracetamol. On another channel, you see your temperature rose. But you actually have to record both of them at quite a high resolution before you can figure out which happened first. <clears throat> Beyond streams of data, there are many other hybrid examples which we also care about. One is where you don't have a single stream of data, but you have a large collection of streams of similar data, a crowd of people moving around. Each one constitutes a stream. The ensemble constitutes an ensemble of streams. And there are many basic questions that you might actually want to answer about such a stream. You might want to. Observe a population of people, and you observe their lives up to, say, 50. And then you observe their lives from 50. 
And then you might take a single new person whose life you've observed up to 50, and you might like to, well, you probably want to predict what's going to happen, but that's an error. You might like to describe the law of what's going to happen based on the evidence of the other people. You should describe the distribution of what happens. You should never try and predict what happens. You can see that from financial markets. Markets are fair. They're going up and down all the time. It's not really of interest to know whether it's going to go up or down next time because you're never going to get that right. What's interesting, actually, is whether the expected value of that increment is above zero or below zero. That's of interest. That's a question about the distribution of what happens, not a question about what happens. And that is typical of the sort of challenges you might want to study. Now, what I would like to say is we all have lots of examples of these kinds of problems. But I think most of the time, people run to use their special knowledge prematurely. I am not saying you should not use your special knowledge, not at all. But I am saying that actually these questions already connect to quite a substantial body of mathematics that can pose serious questions and ways of thinking um, without reference to that special knowledge. Just as when you do arithmetic, the calculator does not need to know whether you are counting apples or Lamborghinis or ideas. And that is what abstraction of mathematics actually does for you. Now, how can we unify streams of data? How can we get to think about streams of data in a way that is essentially mathematical and universal and doesn't really care whether that stream was your finger moving across the, the um, screen or the patients in the hospital? What is a good way of doing it? It doesn't work for the movie directly, but we'll see. Well, it turns out, in a way, the answer goes back to Newton. The answer is calculus, and particularly the calculus of interacting systems. And that was really a key thing Newton introduced. He wrote down the way that two systems interact and influence each other. And what I'm trying to tell you is an efficient way of understanding a stream of data is to let it interact with things and see what happens. What we've tended to do in the past is look at its value at times, and that's not really a very efficient way of doing things. Letting it interact and looking at the interactions is more like a physics idea, but you can make it a math idea, and it can be powerful. And the great thing is that, in a way, Newton wrote down how to do this. He wrote down calculus. He gave us the language. Well, not the language we use anymore, but he gave us the mathematical language needed to talk about interactions between systems. Your planets on the one hand and your Earth on the other, and the interactions between them. That calculus has done us very well, indeed. But it's all about understanding interactions between smoothly varying, smoothly moving objects. Actually, when you really think about it, that doesn't even fit his own examples, because we now know that there are billions of planets and astronomical objects, all of which at some micro level affecting the motion of planet Earth. So it's not clear that planet Earth is not being bumped around by some very high-frequency data. But we understand that we get away with it. But mathematically, it had this idea of a controlled differential equation. The evolution of some system was a consequence of some driving motion, in our case, a signal of interest. And the signals Newton dealt with were smooth. The signals Ito dealt with in 1942, which was a complete breakthrough, was Ito understood how to make sense of these kinds of equations, these evolution equations, when the driving signal was more like a Brownian motion. We'll see that that's not really good enough for us, but it was a massive breakthrough because classical calculus simply did not deal with this. W is in itself not differentiable if it's a Brownian motion, so you cannot use 
the classical calculus. And what Ito did is he found a new way of doing this, which was incredibly successful, and of which we couldn't do a lot of modern mathematics without. And it relied on very fundamental mathematics of other people at the time. But it was, you know, it was a massive interactive breakthrough. But it has a weakness. It has a strong weakness. And that weakness is that actually, Ito didn't tell you how to understand this evolution. What he told you was how to understand it almost all of the time, almost surely. And the problem with that is whenever you're given a particular path, it's always a null set, so you never know what's happening. And it seemed like that this was a fundamental obstruction that stopped stochastic calculus going any further and lived in a world called semi-martingales, which we don't need to go into. And that's pretty disappointing because most real data isn't a Brownian motion, isn't naturally a semi-martingale. This is a good example of some real data. Originally, it was video data. But within the video data, Mohammed has constructed a very nice thing that boxes everything and turns it into a stream of quite intelligible and relatively low-dimensional data telling the Cartesian position of each vehicle when it comes in, whether it turns left, whether it turns right. And actually, the sort of real-world typical stream, not so different to a hospital or anything else. And um, it's not naturally a semi martico Well, this is where rough path theory comes in, because rough path theory was a development that happened over the last 20 years or so, and basically understood how to write down a calculus for interacting systems when those interacting systems are not probabilistic Brownian motions or whatever, it's much closer to Newton in a way. It's a generalization of the notion of a smooth path. And I've already hinted at what you do. You see, the problem of Kolmogorov and Dube in their rigorous stochastic processes is this idea that you describe a stream as a time series. You describe a stream by telling you what happens at times. Kolmogorov's idea was that you looked at gates and you looked at the set of paths that went through an opening. This was the whole structure. And the problem with this is that that's not actually what we're interested in. And it turns out it's a very poor description of some things we are interested in. There's a good paper by um, Cameron, who was a student of Martin Clark, who is a, an alumni of Imperial. Um, still around, I think, actually. I mean, we, I had dinner with him only a few uh, week, months ago. Um, and sampling is a very poor description. It's a bottom-up description, that's why. And when you get more and more complex signals, bottom-up becomes more and more problematic. And it's certainly not what we do in practice. If we were to try and describe a stream which was a movie, or even just a book, which is simpler. Would we really describe it as a time series? The 73rd word was the. The 74th word was this. And it, you can see quickly that if you subsample, the subsamples are totally inadequate very quickly. It's not what we do. If we want to describe a movie, we give a top-down description. We say, well, it starred X, Y, Z. The first bit of it was where we met this, the characters and we discovered that our character we thought was a hero was not, and so on and so forth. We do not do it by describing it bottom up. We describe it top down. So what we're looking for, and what rough path theory does for you, is it gives you a way of understanding streams of data top down. And that actually allows you, that was the original motivation, it allows you to deal with complex signals without tunneling down to the microstructure which is a complexity issue, which means that you can actually manage and prove things without collapsing when the paths no longer have finite length or even Brownian length. 
Okay. And the way we do it is what I said before. The top-down description says, let's look at what this stream does to systems. This is the idea that some of you will have heard of as reservoir computing. But in reservoir computing, you normally use a black box. You look at the effect on a random system. Rough path theory is different to that. It actually recognizes from the mathematics of the last 100 years or so that there are actually some very canonical nonlinear systems to look at. And these canonical nonlinear systems are intrinsically defined. They don't need a context. So that's the basic idea. And because we're looking at how it interacts with systems, it's a physical thing. You don't have to, you'll see people talking about iterated integrals. But in fact, that's not really the right way to look at it. This is the right way to look at it. And then this is something physical. You have a stream. You have some nonlinear systems. You see what the stream does to the system. If it's a financial market, you see what the stream does to certain hedging strategies. You lose money, get money, etc. But in fact, what we want to do is we solve a differential equation. We solve a very simple differential equation. And this is calculus again. There's our stream. And if this were not there, and it was just multiplication, everything was scalars, this would mean you would exponentiate it. But in fact, this is a very non-commutative version of that, called a tensor product. And the way to think about this from a mathematical point of view is that you imagine that your stream is living in a vector space, and the vector space has a basis of letters, which we can call an alphabet then y, when you work it out, evolves in the space of linear combinations of words. So if I freeze it after a, I start at 1 at the beginning of my interval, and I run to the end of an interval, well, the other way around, sorry, I've, yeah, no, that's right. I solve the end of the interval. I'm going to end up with a linear combination of words. And those coefficients are what we call the signature of this path. It's quite an interesting and easy idea. And it works. And it turns out that this signature is a fundamental object. And it's fundamental in two different ways. First of all, it kills something. And we'll come back to that. But basically, it kills the speed at which you go along your stream. If you want to capture that in your data, just add it as a parameter. It'll turn out later, and I'll explain it in the second half, that this is actually a really valuable thing to do. And the other thing is, modulo that, it tells you everything. You've lost absolutely no information. So you've encoded the unparameterized path in this signature. But you've done many other things. One of them is actually you've created each coefficient is a function on the path. And data science is all about functions on paths. We would like to look at the streams that are patient histories. And we would like to recognize, as in the previous lecture, that they are likely to get sepsis. You'd like to wave a flag to say, this person is in danger of getting sepsis. That is a function. It's a function on the stream whose value is warning, warning, or not warning, not warning. And we are generating a, a class of functions, a subtle class of functions, that is guaranteed to capture all the information. Now, the papers I showed you were all old, but actually there's a lot of interesting stuff still really going on, and I don't want to leave you with any other impression. But on the other hand, nor am I going to have a lot of time to talk about these things. You'll see Chris's name occurs quite often. Um, right. So I have just explained that out of that very abstract picture, we generated a way of, descri of describing, generating, 
in a canonical way, functions on our stream. So I always think of a stream as a finite thing with a beginning and an end, but a generic thing. I don't know which stream. And now I have been, I've got a way of looking at functions on those streams. And that's the sort of thing I want for the sepsis. But it's no good if I don't have enough of them. And so the idea here is actually you do have enough of them. Because it turns out that if you take two of these coefficients, so these are like linear functions on the signature, and you multiply them together, that's a quadratic function on the tensor algebra, on these space of words, spanned by words. But, and this is a remarkable, well-known fact, which goes back to Re in, uh, I guess, 1958, that you take this product and you can rewrite it as a sum. In other words, this class of functions that we're looking at is rich enough to contain all the polynomials. That's exciting. Because polynomials by stone vastras on finite or compact sets are rich enough to get every continuous function within uniform approximation. So this is a universality that tells you that this way of looking at the data is sufficient to allow you to capture a huge class of naturally arising functions on unparameterized paths. <coughs> so this is just straight math of a level that is not difficult to do and is accessible at an undergraduate level. And it applies to data like this. So on the left, we see data from an intensive care unit. And it led to a, my student, James Murill, leading an effort in PhysioNet 2019, which is a, a significant medical data international competition every year, run by uh, MIT with some support from Google. And um, that competition was indeed about using this data to provide early prediction of sepsis. And they provided the data sets. We would say that the criteria need to be chosen carefully, and it's not clear they were. I mean, but anyway, what the outcome of that was, I think, about 100 entries at the end of people who enter every year and who are basically good at this stuff. We were beginners, and we won. We only just won, I think, but we won. Um, and we used signatures. I think the team was called, Have I Got Your Signature? This is another class of data which I just want to emphasize. Human data is so amenable to this sort of analysis and so not amenable to so many time series approaches. This actually is mood. There's an interesting paper uh, where we looked, where we took um, self-reported mood by a cohort of 100 people for a year, in as much as they could record it. I mean, they didn't always record it. It was complicated, and. This is just a graph of mood plotted against mood over one month or something similar. Um, here's angry and anxious and so on. And you basically get this understanding that the way mood evolves is complicated. But what we showed by batching this up in a particular way was that actually this is quite enough information to figure out which of the three cohorts were inside the cohort. There was a cohort of people with a di diagnosis of bipolar disorder. There was a cohort of people with a borderline personality disorder. And there was a, a cohort of people with a diagnosis of normal. And um, it was quite easy, actually, to discriminate between the groups using the signature, which produces a low dimensional feature set, which you could manage with the size of data that we had just and do it. So I want to tell you that these are the kind of data sets I find interesting. But I also want to tell you that actually, you know, these things are everywhere. This, this data over here is actually shipping data. It's short periods of movement of ships. And 
This one here is malware. And this actually is a collection of paths. It's a tree. But you can think of a tree as a collection of paths that branch out from each other. It's an ensemble of paths. And in both cases, we can do really quite useful things. And again, Chris was heavily involved with this one. Um, I think you'll agree. Yeah. Um, but what I like about this one is the opposite. I would like to take these into an algebra class and say, look, what do you think of that element of tensor algebra? And what do you think of these elements of tensor algebra? Oh, these are all group-like, so if you run them backwards, you get inverses. The point is that actually there's a gap in communication. And that people who work in non-commutative algebra, of which there were very fine contributions over many, many years, I don't think really realize that they're talking about stream data. And equally well, people who work in stream data don't think they're talking about tensor algebras. There's a gap there, and I do not claim to have the answer to it all, and nor do I want to be thought of as pushing that the algorithms we use to literally use these things like linear functions and signature, because it's obvious that the signature describes everything, and for the same reason, it's obvious that it has too much information. So it's clear that you need to understand how to reduce that information. We do that with a lot of the things that we do already. But I think conceptually, we need to think about these things. And it lets you think about these things. So actually, to deal with this stuff, there is a knowledge gap. And it's actually quite a complex knowledge gap because you need to be able to do computations. If you're going to do data, you need to do uh, computations. And the computations are not trivial. And the reason they're not trivial, tensors are not too difficult to deal with. But actually, the, they're not generic tensors we look at. They are these group-like elements I mentioned a minute ago. And the way you understand these group-like elements quite often is by taking logarithms. And when you take logarithms, you end up with free Lie elements. And these are a really good representation from a certain perspective of your stream. The problem is, although they're a vector space, they don't have a canonical basis. The basis for these spaces are well studied by mathematicians. You can find books talking about them. And, but that's a bit much for your ordinary data scientists today. Right? So actually what you need is software that understands this expert knowledge, allows you to work with these objects without necessarily expecting you to write it all yourself. Well, we're into what I think is now the second generation of that kind of software. So there's a fair amount of software out there with at least three significant sensible packages for just computing signatures and log signatures. And it's available on the GPU. It's available on the CPU. And they're useful. But now we're moving on, and rough pi, which is an alpha form, so if you use it, expect to find a few bugs, expect that the, that, the, um, that the documentation is not what it should be, but it's still very impressive, I think. Rough pi is our attempt, and it's a serious attempt, it's not a toy, um, to provide a package which allows you to look at real-world data and think of it in this abstract way where you do not have to get involved in the real world data after you've transformed it into a stream. And the basic idea is that you have an object in the Python called a stream. And a stream just consumes some external data. In this case, I'm illustrating it with an electricity data and I'm taking the voltage and current, and I'm looking over at this point in time, a 50th of a second, you know, one cycle. And I'm using public domain data. So the first thing, it's in a sound file. That's the way these people encoded it. The first thing you do is you encode the signature. It's a two-dimensional path. And we're going to look at it to depth six. That means we're going to work out somehow the sixth order representation from the top. And uh, that's all you do. And you shove your data in, and now you have a stream. But then you can query the stream on any interval. 
And it's clever. It caches things, so it works out things quickly. You don't have to work out everything from scratch every time. So the idea is that then you can query it on any interval, like I was talking about a minute ago. So you consume the data, you can query it, and you can visualize it, and you can do things like UMAP and so on, if you know what they are. So I just, I'm getting to the point where I'm really about to finish the first half. This actually is the actual, just the increments. It's not actually the, the voltage or the current. It's the increments, the voltage and current. It's like the derivative. And interestingly, this data has a <coughs> continuous derivative, but that's not really the point. I, I just want you to see that it's real and complex, and it varies a lot. Well, not a lot. It varies from one 50th of a second to the next. So there you are. There's an actual question. How would you go away and describe these? Where is your language to tell me how to describe these curves? Right? To reduce it to a set of features we can do with data science. You really want us to regard all of those as time series? We really want a time series for every one of these 50ths of a second? It's going to overwhelm you, and you're not going to see any patterns. But actually, we can compute the signature or the log signature, and here they are down there. And we can take the first few terms, and that gives us a top-down description of what we want. And believe it or not, if what you want is your electricity bill for the year, you only need one of these terms. The very top term is going to tell you how much power you're using. And you only need it once for the whole series. But you can do things after that, right? Now we've found this way. We've converted every one of these cycles into a descriptor, which is three or four dimensional or 10 dimensional. We can then use tools like UMAP to actually figure out which, you know, how different one cycle is to another and things like that. That's actually the sort of thing we want to do because actually a goal with this particular data is to understand which appliances are on, which appliances are off. This is actually a data recorded from four student houses for a couple of years. And the goal of that was to understand the power, how the power is being used and so on. So the idea is you'd like to be able to say, oh, the television's on, and so on. And you can do that, and I'm not going to spend any more time on it. I'm, this is my last slide of the first half of my talk, where we can find out whether I'm three quarters of the way or four quarters of the way through. Yeah, that's fine. And um, right, I just want to finish the talk by saying that there's a huge number of people out here trying to use these things now. I think it's fair to say there's quite a lot of noise. Not everything is of top quality. But one can't control that. But I think there has absolutely been groundbreaking work in certain specific areas. For example, and I'll mention that later in astronomy, one company, just in one area, by using these things, by using their universality, essentially, to find the right function with moderate amounts of data, was able to save 90 million or something in one go. Um, I think this is the sort of savings that people can really make and do with these things. It's not a game. I should mention, before I finish as well, that Chinese handwriting application. Actually, that went from Ben Graham in Warwick, whose idea it was to combine signatures with deep learning at that point, to winning a competition like the sepsis, to getting taken up by the South China University of Technology, which developed an app that got wonderful rave reviews from everybody who used it and a couple of million users, to being taken up by one of the large keyboard providers in China, and I think it's still there. And that component of their software is the most important component only for about 18%, because most people use Pinyin. Um, but 18% of 500 million users is still quite a few users. And um, I stop now. I'd love you to ask me some questions. 
And I've got another bit, and the other bit is going to do a bit more serious theory and a bit more detail about applications. But this bit was really about trying you to understand what is a stream. OK? Thank you very much. Um, I don't really have a background in a rough um, call, I guess I really need to remember, a path theory. But um, I know a little bit about reservoir computing. Would you mind clarifying the relationship between reservoir computing, these signatures, and yeah? yeah That's thank easy. You. Thank you. So reservoir computing, you tend to have restricted yourself to some sort of complex dynamical system. And then what you look at is, is its interaction with the reservoir. A dyna another dynamical system, which may well be a physical dynamical system, right? and you look at the response, and you try and use that response to learn something. Right? And typically, that reservoir is sort of random and frozen. And, right? OK, the only difference between that and what I'm suggesting here is that instead of using a black box, you use a white box. You know what the nonlinear system is. So instead of just taking an arbitrary system, you take this very specific non-commutative exponential as your system, which is something that makes sense universally. And you can even, if you knew what your black box was, you can probably go backwards and go between the two. But by using the white box, at least mathematically, perhaps in practice not, this allows you to think about things like the signature, like the log signature. It opens up an entire vocabulary of mathematics that's been around since the 50s, which you can then utilize. So that the basic idea that you want to look at what it does instead of its values is a, is a really common aspect between reservoir computing and what I'm talking about, all right? Yeah. I mean, basically, you've got this complex thing is you can't understand. I mean, it's a good example, you see, in the dynamical system. You can't really understand what's going on by looking at the values, right? But there are lots of situations where people think they can, but they're wrong, really. Um, they'd be much better off using nonlinear sensors than linear sensors. Um, to understand what's going on. Thank you for that question. Let's run it back. Hi. Um, <clears throat> sorry. So you showed a very generic sort of uh, differential equation. Sorry? You showed a generic differential equation. I, I'm just, I guess, not clear how like the different streams of data that you have, how does it, how does the same equation with the same, I mean, do you have the, the how same does the, How does the same equation with the same initial conditions and everything, how does it, what is the thing that, you know, where does the data go in? Where does your what specific, is the? Where does the specific, your data set, where does it actually f figure into this? Where does it go into? Okay, fine, fine, fine. So the question is, why is, I think it is anyway, why is that particular differential equation a good one to look at. Right? What is it giving you? Yeah, and where does the data yeah, go? That's a very good question, all right? And I think the answer is it's a generating function. The solution to this equation, well, the first thing is the solution to this differential equation does not need a context. It just needs a stream in a vector space. It can have jumps. It can do all sorts of things, right? And it applies to your health data. It applies to lots of things, right? It's an equation that um, actually the solution of it is a generating function. If you write down the Picard iteration way of looking at it, you get these iterated integrals. And they are a generating function. You can show that any differential equation can be approximated over small time intervals using linear functionals of this one. So this actually contains all the information you need to do all the other ones. It may not be in quite the right order and things. You may have to repackage it, but it contains the information. This was a basic result of rough path theory. A basic result of rough path theory is that you could solve a differential equation with a complicated signal, 
providing you knew the first few terms of this signature, and you knew them everywhere. Right? So it's, it's a top-down way of understanding the data that allows you to understand the interaction without going down to the microstructure. I don't know if that answers your question. It answers part of it, I think. Are there biological systems which use these kind of top-down methods um, to, to analyze um, incoming sensory data? Sorry? I, I missed the beginning of you. Um, are there biological systems? Are there what systems? Biological systems. Biological systems. Like the brain, which use these top-down methods. Uh, to Internally? Yeah, to analyze sensory incoming data. Um. That's very I don't have a. I have. Were I to speculate, I would say surely. Were I to say, do I know? I would say I haven't got a clue, right? I. I it's quite interesting to take the words of the English language, or the. You could do the phonetic version of it, but you can take the words of the English language and you can think of them as a stream, or as an ensemble in reality. You can compute this signature for each word. It's very interesting to ask yourself, and in fact, one of my students was just going to do it a week ago, and they haven't told me the answer. How deep do you have to go before you separate all the words in the English language? I think it's probably, I would guess it's three. So the first level actually just looks at the anagrams. So if you have the same signature, it means your anagrams. The second level is actually quite a lot more subtle because it captures second order orders. I would be very surprised if the third order didn't completely clinch the whole of, any, of almost any language. A more interesting one would definitely be the phonetic one, though, right? Because in a sense, phonetic words are real biological words, whereas letters are not. I don't know is the answer, but I, I imagine very few. So actually, a typical nonlinear system driven by the phonetic words will actually differentiate them very easily. And so... Yeah, I think that maybe answers your question, but I haven't got a clue, right? I've not ever had a research grant that needs to enable me to do that, right? Thank you for the lovely talk. Um, one application domain which is very close to what you discussed is anomaly detection yeah. in cybersecurity. Yeah, well, that's how we started doing it. And Because we have a collaboration with the spies, right? A more traditional approach time series approach to this, there's a huge problem with fat tails, with kind of too many false positives, because essentially the distribution of anomalies is fat tailed. Is that something? No, that's because the distribution of the non-anomalies is fat tailed. <laughs> Sorry, exactly. yeah. true. <laughs> um, um, is this something where passing to the signature helps? Yeah, for sure. So sort of I don't know that, that we're going to have time for talk two. <laughs> um, yeah, we've probably got 10, 15 minutes. Right? I will give you a couple of examples where actually this works. The real problem in doing it in the cybersecurity is that actually the key to anomaly detection is having large collections of normality. Uh-huh. Right? I would love to have the home office computer servers the tree of their events for a year or two. And then I think we'd be actually really quite capable of pointing out to them that something worth looking at is going on. And that would not just be the home office. It could be Rolls Royce. Sure, it could be anybody. Sure. But I mean, actually, I think one of the challenges there is reluctance and GDPR and all those sorts of things, right? But I think, in fact, the key to good anomaly detection in stream data, and this is interesting, this is not change points, this is different paths, right? It's the, it's the person who's sick compared with all the people who are not sick, right? The, the making that happen, the key to it, funnily enough, is not getting lots of people who are sick it's getting a huge number of people who are not sick. Because you see, you're looking in high dimensional data. And there is no way you can learn what sick means because you don't have enough of them. But you really need to learn 
what non-sick is. And I'll come to an example of that later on, where we really use that with, Birch, with modern natural language processing, combined with signatures, to do something useful. Um, but yeah, it can, but it's no miracle. I want to emphasize that, though, right? The truth is the signature has the disadvantage that it captures everything. Sure. Right? And then you need to know how to project it down, how to take a lower one, and then maybe to search around and do machine learning to try and find the correct projection for your problem. Although for anomaly detection, you maybe don't want to do that, because for anomaly detection, you really do want to see the things that happen happen. You don't want to suppress the information about that which has not happened. Anomaly detection is the opposite of trying to focus your attention on what happens. It's about trying to collapse attention of what happens and notice when it's not like that. Um, yeah? Thank you for the question. Right, so I better get back. OK, thank you very much for your engagement. And um, we'll probably whiz through this bit, because although I, have, I think I have significantly more than we can fit in the time. Yeah, I think I'm going to look at the example. I know I'm going to do the underpinnings, because I think you need to see that. And then I'm going to look at the examples. And I'm just going to tell you there's lots of interesting things going on right now. OK? <clears throat> so this is the key point, actually, of the whole business of why it works. You may not have, well, you probably have heard, oh, we can deal with high dimensions because the real data isn't really high dimensional. It's a low dimensional manifold living in a high dimensional space. Actually, that's only true if there's no symmetries. If there are symmetries, it's absolutely not true. Data science hates symmetry. Why? Because what does symmetry mean? It means there's different ways of representing the same thing. That's what symmetry means. And that's really bad for data science, because it means you've got to learn that all these different things mean the same thing. And the thought of mathematically, it's saying if you're, there was your data you were really interested in, it wasn't really there, because the symmetry puts a fiber in the opposite direction. So actually, it's a, there's a fibered space, and you don't have this manifold. You have it with sort of fiber. Now, that wouldn't matter if the fiber was one or two-dimensional. But the most significant fiber that can happen in stream data is reparameterizing the data, just sampling it at a different rate. Resampling the data, that's a group of symmetries, and it's a huge infinite dimensional nonlinear group of symmetries. So all of these methods involving differential equations allow you to think about what happened in a way that ignores the parameterization. It looks at the stream without the parameterization. Because if you solve the differential equation quicker, you just get to the answer quicker. They are all autonomous differential equations I wrote down. If you want time in there, put it in there. But by and large, you want to have a way of featuring your data that does not care about the days on which you had your scans. You want something which is robust to different sampling rates. And signatures and this whole differential equation approach are really rather good at that. And this three is a good example, right? Because we can think of the three as a time series, one, two, three, like that. Or we can just think of it as a par, a curve, where we don't care about the parameterization. It's obvious from the recognition point of view that you don't care, right? But look at the difference between the x and y coordinates if you happen to use a different parameterizations. And there you begin to realize what's going wrong. You've got to learn that these are the same. But you see, they affect totally different. If you're going to do a wavelet decomposition or something, the wavelets will just be totally different. The reality is the coefficients of the signature will be identical because they quotient out that uncertainty. And this is a big deal. Unfortunately, it's only half of a big deal. It factors out an infinity of garbage, but it leaves you with an infinity of things you're interested in. It's still an exponentially big problem. It just has managed to clutter, get rid of a lot of clutter you don't care about. <clears throat> uh, 
And except for this last point, which I'll emphasize again, it gives you a feature set that doesn't really care how often you sample your data. It cares about the data, but if you sample it a little bit more often or a bit less often, it's really not going to make much difference. Yeah, I don't want to spend too much on that now. We haven't got time. This is interesting and actually, again, involves Chris. Um, one of the things that's happened is that there are kernels <coughs> that arise here. If you're into data science, you'll know what kernels are. But the kernels are really interesting because not only can you, can you define them, there are kernel tricks, but the kernel tricks are PDEs. They're hyperbolic PDEs. And I don't think anybody would have guessed that you'd end up going from data science to a hyperbolic PDE. And so we're generating new bits of reasons for looking at math. But actually, it generates some very deep mathematics I don't have time to talk about now, about how you can actually make sense of these PDEs when the data is complex and rough. The fact that we're beginning to be able to make sense of them it's really quite exciting, but I think it's exciting to the PDE people we talk about as well as to the data science we're trying to do. But I haven't got time to go through that. I wanted to look at the examples. So one example we've been working on for quite a long time, and actually half of it at least is at Imperial, is radio frequency interference. Telescopes get more sensitive. Human beings generate more noise. This is bad news for astronomy because all of the time you get more and more interference coming into your telescopes. It's a serious and important challenge. Some would say one of the most important challenges in, for example, the SKA, the square kilometre away, to sort of understand the periods where somebody started their car and the and the radio frequencies are polluted, so you don't try and read things that are just noise and find something exciting in them. So the idea is, how do you identify the intervals of time where your data is screwed up? You've got hundreds of these telescopes out there. You want to analyze that data. Well, it turns out that using outlier techniques, understanding what normality is, and then segmenting correctly, you can really do this. And it just about got to the point where I hope we can put in a paper in a few months, in, well, in the next month about this. Um, but the amazing thing is that this abstract outlier approach can be turned to be a useful tool in this space and is absolutely competitive with what people use at the moment. So there are two basic packages that people use for doing this. And this is real world data. And you'll see that they both recognize this is different frequencies, this is time. And you'll see that most of it is not got in interference. But in the areas where there is interference, both of them find some. But what you notice is that our one, finds more, but does not find noise. So it's not like we've turned up the amplitude and we get a load of noise. We simply are better at finding the weak signals. And the point is the difference in mindset between these is that we do not have a model for what interference looks like. We have a model for what normality looks like. <clears throat> and we, can, we notice when it doesn't look normal all the others sort of are cleverly working out some model for what interference might be. And they find their model of interference. And the outlier approach is more generic, less complicated, and more effective. So that's interesting, because it's also an important question. But this is the one I want to do very quickly, and maybe this is the right place to end, actually. Um, I don't want to push your tolerance too far. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier on, and I think this is a really important idea, 
that if you're looking at streams of data, tend to be potentially extremely high dimensional. If you think you can go and find out something useful about it by looking at 50 or 100 or even maybe 50,000 data points, you're dreaming. Because it's inconceivable that you can say something interesting about a million dimensional space with 50,000 points. You need something out there that helps you make sense. What you actually need is what I would call expert knowledge, what is important. But you actually can do that with data-driven expert knowledge. So in a lot of situations, language, for example, we have expert knowledge now. BERT is a way of taking sentences, and based on training in a huge number of sentences, is a way of taking them and putting contextual information, giving you an embedding that contains contextual information. Okay? That's expert knowledge. That's nothing to do with my little problem. So how can we put that sort of technology together with something like signatures, which really couldn't cope with a thousand-dimensional space, but which can cope with complex orders of things and so on. How can we put these two together? That's actually a really serious question. And amazingly, there is a sort of answer to it. So this particular example is actually in mental health. And it's about looking at streams of social media texts and trying to make sense of streams of social media texts. Well, that's a high dimensional space. You know, you look at streams of high of, of social media text, you are seriously talking about high dimensions if you don't do something with it. But you can do something with it using BERT. BERT is a well-developed natural language processing tool that takes your data and, as I said, contextualizes it. Basically, it takes each thing. And if you have, I mean, we're using sentence BERT, but I'll say the word BERT. You know, you come along he, then BERT is capable of telling you, really, that the he this time was the John you mentioned before. It brings the context to where you are. Just as Google Maps brings the context to where you are geographically, right? Google Maps will tell you what's going on in the neighborhood of where you are. <clears throat> so BERT is a Google Maps for language. It tells you what's going on in a neighborhood at a point. But it increases the dimension quite a lot. But it has another effect. It actually makes the data essentially Markov. It means you don't need to know what happened before or after to really understand what's happening now. And the thing about Markov processes is you can apply nonlinear transformations to them, and they stay Markov. So we can take the values that this high-dimensional system used, which was nothing like all of this high-dimensional space, and we can use some nonlinear map to take those down to a low-dimensional space. And because of the Markovianness at this point, that's OK. And then we have a path in the low dimensional space. And to get from there to here, we are just using UMAP, which is a pretty good visualization thing that can take high dimensional data and map it onto low dimensional data without losing too much structure. <clears throat> and so this is a pipeline that starts with sentence BERT, maps through UMAP down to a low dimensional object, and then uses standard signatures and <coughs> LSTM and all that sort of thing to analyze the low-dimensional data. And it does better than anything it's done so far. We probably have all these queries about, we were learning from the previous lecture about changing the set and so on. But you know, it, it, it's a rational, logical way to combine expert knowledge, which is the BERT, dimension reduction, visualization, and then you now have a sequence in a moderate dimensional space, stream in a moderate dimensional space, that you can understand properly. The only problem with doing this is that this bit is not transparent. If you did it again, you get a different projection onto low dimensions. OK, I think that's the place to stop. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is a place also to start. Um, you know, 
it's a place to start where you're mapping your data into low dimensional space. So how do you, um, so have you evaluated the reproducibility of these maps? Have you? Evaluated the reproducibility because you know, like when you're mapping into a low dimensional space, if you perturb a little bit the training data, right, you may have shifts in your representation in the lower dimensional space using UMAP. I think, UMAP I think you have to decide your projection once and for all, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the bigger the data set you use at the beginning to get this projection, you don't have to use only your data, right? Right? The bigger the projection you use at the beginning, so that actually <clears throat> everything that could happen has been seen. The point you're trying to take advantage of is that the reality is that the embedding maps you into a huge space, the vast majority of it you never use. The visualization is good at taking the things you've used and mapping them onto a low dimensional space, keeping distances and relationships more or less the same. It's no good if it's not seen it. You can rely on that function, which you keep after you know, store it, you mail it and you store it, right? It's no good if your new piece of data, is some, your new embedding is not something you've ever seen before because the visualizations works out what to do with the data it sees or nearby, right? Yeah. Um, so you really need to use your expert knowledge, right? You've got to have as much expert knowledge as you can possibly have at that point. But then it's reasonable, right? Because then you won't change it. You do, it won't migrate, it's just a lang. I mean, what will happen is if you choose a different data or you choose a different population, like we were talking about in the lecture before, what will happen is that you will see a whole shift in the law of, yeah, but then you will, right? Yeah. That's it, yeah. right? You will. You will yeah. And so, you, you know, you look at different data, it behaves in a different way, and you're going to have to learn how to do it differently or you're going to have to learn how to put them all together, mm -hmm. right? So if you compare the original signature uh, based on your, the RAF path theory, right, and... Well, you and are the, using signatures, but on the projected data. So can you, can, you just, can you just take the time series or the streaming data and pass it through, for example, a simple auto-encoder? No, no, but UMAP right? is being applied to the value of the... It's breaking my principle okay. that you look at the integral. It's looking at the value but it's using the value after you've applied something which contextualizes. So it's like a conf you're mapping the context down. So, so you're not mapping the original data because, so I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a bit confused here. So when, when you first presented the signatures, the beautiful signatures yeah. that you displayed and say they're very powerful representations using uh, these partial differential equations yeah. and the tensor algebra that you mentioned, right? So it, an idea came to my mind. It's like, why can we not just use a neural network, a regular, simple neural network, where we learn this signature in a low embed, you know, like embedded space, right? Okay. By just training a I neural network on this time series. What you saying, yeah. which is surely true, is you can probably reinterpret much of birth and things like that using language of signatures, right? that actually the context could be thought of as a sort of partial signature of what came before and what comes after and so on. And so a trained version of that is sort of, you could, if I had the energy, I could rewrite NLP to embed this way of thinking into it. And it would not seem unnatural, right? Because you, again, you look, if you think about it, Bert or any of these things uses the stream to give a value at the point, yep. right? <clears throat> so all of that's quite natural. It's just very high dimensional. And in a sense, people have already worked out a workable model of how to do these things at that level. And we're harnessing that. I am not saying we couldn't go back and with an even bigger research grant than the last one, um, actually do something there, but we haven't. Okay, thank you very much. I really need to f reflect upon that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, can I just uh, maybe exhibit my ignorance and ask... Hang on, I have to come. Oh, sorry. Um, can you expand upon this idea of depth in... Can I explain? The idea of depth, because you said, like... Yes, yeah, of course. Uh, um, of course. I, I didn't that's really a good, no, that's a good thing. I haven't really. Um, there's even a slide, really, that sort of brings it up. Um, yeah. 
When you try to solve the differential equation for the signature, it's very natural to think about Picard iteration as a way of getting it. When you do that, you realize you write down a series of iterated integrals, actually. So the first integral is just literally the integral of the path. That's the synonym. You look at the words that have the same number of A's, the same number of B's. Then you have a second iterated integral and a third iterated integral. Each of these is a feature or a collection of features corresponding to words of length three or words of length four. And so that's the, that's the depth. So the idea is that you have um, the full signature is a linear combination of words. The depth three signature only looks at words of length three or less. The length four signature only looks at words of length four or less. So you have this graded family. And indeed, you can do differently. You can weight the different letters differently so that you have things that have pay more attention to some bits than other bits and so on. right? But basically, they capture order. The, the level one, the chord that Newton used, doesn't capture the order of the bits of path at all. It just replaces it by the straight line. And if we move them around, you get the same answer. The next one captures the area. And the area does change if you move them around. And the third one catches the third thing, and so on. So as you get higher, you get exponentially more features, which is why it's a bit nasty. <laughs> to say the least, right? That doesn't mean the first few aren't useful, right? But this is the top-down description. Can I just check that I understand? So here, gamma and tau, right, in this light, gamma and tau are your signals, right? So yeah. And then the S. two paths in yeah. this. They're two streams in the same vector space. OK, so S is a feature map. And we, we compute an inner product. So this S is, a, is the signature. It's a kernel method, right? You just said. Well, the kernel is when you take the inner product of them. For all the signatures. That's the signature. Yeah. That's the signature. And now you take their inner product, which you can if the original vector space had an inner product. And that's then a kernel. Yeah. Right? So it could be used as a kernel method in machine learning, right? Yeah. This business. This gives you just a, a good feature map, a, a good universal feature map in some sense. Is it well, it's more than that. It is a universal feature map, yeah. but it's not. I think the crucial thing about a kernel is that you have a kernel trick. Yes. Here it's you the cost cannot... of the kernel trick yeah. that makes it useful, okay. right? And it also reduces the dimensionality, doesn't it? So you think of it as linear functionals on the dates you've already seen or yeah. something like that, right? Here, the kernel trick is the PDE. OK. Right? And the kernel trick is really good, well-defined kernel trick if the paths are bounded variation. Works really well. It's much more subtle to make it work if the paths are really rough paths. But I think we can say with confidence now, using rough pi, actually, that Maud has effective algorithms which really work in that case. And are there any trainable parameters here? Yes. Well, are there any hyperparameters? Yes, exactly. Like there are the, yeah, definitely the kernels, there are hyperparameters yeah. because you can scale the path. And you can take mixtures of scaled paths. So there's an interesting paper by Tom Cass, who's probably not here because he's in Princeton at the moment. Um, Tom Cass looks at the kernel you get by taking. So when you scale the path, this does not scale the kernel. You know, the kernel is a function on pairs of paths. So that's an obvious invariance, that you can do linear transformation of the paths and take the inner product of the linear transformation. It has quite a profound effect, because it's making the things much bigger. Okay? But you can take linear combinations of those to get really interesting objects. And indeed, people have done that. Okay. Makes sense. Maybe just one last thing. You wrote this differential equation, ds equal s tensor d gamma. Right? <coughs> I don't understand that because it seems that the left-hand side has a different dimension right, that, that, than the right-hand side. Yeah, but the one is inside the other. The vector space, yeah. the words of length one, are a subspace of all of the words. So it makes sense to multiply anything by them. 
The thing is, when you multiply word of length 7 by word of length 1, you get a word of length 8. That's why when you iterate to get this solution, each iteration produces words that are one letter longer than okay. the previous one. 